just a quick reminder. Um, in Bio 1, we learned about photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide is taken into a plant through an opening called a stomata, which we'll learn about more later, into the plant. That carbon dioxide is fixed or glued together, making sugar, a carbohydrate. And meanwhile, oxygen is released by the plant. That's this process here, right? So oxygen's released, CO2 is brought in, sugar is made. Meanwhile, those sugars are transported by a tissue called the phloem to roots where, where that uh, sugar is then stored, usually as like starch. Then you come along and you eat the root. Chewing the root increases its surface area, and you lubricate it with amylase. And you swallow, and you're breaking down the starch of the carrot at that time. The carrot passes through your stomach, where proteins are broken down a little bit. Further digestion takes place in the small intestine when it's hit with pancreatic amylase and those other chemicals which we've talked about, breaking that carrot down. The carbon that that plant originally took in through its stomata and, and turned into sugar is now a glucose molecule, which you've absorbed into your small intestine and is now in your bloodstream. Okay, so this glucose here used to be CO2 in the atmosphere. It was made into glucose by a plant. You ate it. Now it's going through your bloodstream. That glucose molecule then goes into one of your cells, assuming insulin is present, allowing it to enter the cell. <clears throat> Glycolysis kicks in, cellular respiration, all of those things kick in. You break that glucose apart to make ATP, and you release that CO2 back into the atmosphere again, going back to this process which we learned about last semester. Okay, so that's one aspect of how plant and animal nutrition are tied together. And the carbon cycle of the planet is tied together. Now another thing I want to mention is this molecule. What is this molecule? Notice there's a carboxyl group here, an amino group here, an R group here. This is an amino acid. You should be able to recognize that like that. Okay, you're a science major. You have no excuse. <laughs> so this is an amino acid. This is a monomer of a protein. And proteins obviously are super important for life. Uh, the enzymes that we utilize to catalyze our reactions, a lot of our structures made of protein, etc. Proteins are really important, right? And without nitrogen, we can't uh, make the proteins we need. So nitrogen is a really important component of proteins. It's vital. And uh, you might not know this, but like 73% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. You can wave your arm around and feel the nitrogen. However, that nitrogen can't be made directly into protein. It's inaccessible by plants and animals. We can't take it and use it. So plants um, growing in the soil, obviously, they need nitrogen, and uh, atmospheric nitrogen is in the form of N2, uh, gas, you know, it's atmospheric nitrogen. But lucky for us, uh, plants can't use that, but lucky for us, there's all these different kinds of bacteria in the soil. Um, they can, some of these called nitrogen-fixing bacteria, I'd like you to know that word, nitrogen-fixing bacteria. We're not going to learn all the other names of these things like ammonifying, etc., but I'd like you to know nitrogen-fixing bacteria, right? They take nitrogen from the air and they turn it into ammonia and so on and so forth. And eventually, because of other bacteria that interact with these products, they can produce nitrate. And nitrate and ammonium here are both usable by plants to make protein. Okay? So what I'd like you to kind of know is this process down here. Nitrogen from the air becomes ammonia and ammonium. A nitrite becomes nitrate. Okay, so I underlined ammonium and nitrate because those two are usable by plants to make proteins. They can make amino acids and things, okay? So pro proteins require amino acids, and they get that from ammonium or from nitrate. So um, uh, nitrogen from the air gets turned into ammonia by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Other bacteria convert that to ammonium, which plants can use. Uh, some bacteria convert that to nitrite. And then that gets converted to nitrate, which plants can use. So nitrogen is often a major component of fertilizer um, because it's so important because it's vital for making protein. So nitrate and ammonium, usable by plants, 
produced ultimately by nitrogen fixing bacteria. It's more complicated than that, but we'll just learn about nitrogen fixing. Okay. All right. So um, if we look, go back here, um, ammonium NH4, which, which, so nitrogen came in, we formed ammonia, it becomes ammonium. Um, ammonifying bacteria break that down. Nitrogen fixing bacteria convert nitrogen to NH3, so on and so forth. Um, it's pretty complicated chemistry here, right? Um, and we're not going to learn this slide. Uh, unless you're into chemistry, then by all means, please do, because it's important. Um, but what I'd like you to know, really, is this part down here. Okay. Now, some plants have a relationship with nitrogen-fixing bacterium, so much so that they have these little houses for them in their roots. And in this case, this is a legume, a legume, L-E-G-U-M-E. -E. That's a bean family plant, like soybeans or... or, or uh, um, um, alfalfa, other other bean plants, um, they have a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium, meaning a, mu a relationship where they live together. Rhizobium is the name of the bacterium. It's a nitrogen-fixing bacterium. So what it does is it takes nitrogen from the air and converts it uh, into ammonia, which then becomes ammonium or nitrate, and then the plant can use it as fertilizer. So it allows these plants to make their own fertilizer. This is why farmers rotate crops. They have corn one year. Corn uses a bunch of ammonia or a bunch of nitrogen out of the soil. The next year you plant some sort of bean crop there which replenishes uh, nitrogen in the soil because of this symbiotic relationship with rhizobium. And these are called root nodules. So rhizobium, when it interacts with a, with a legume, forms nodules, these little houses for the uh, rhizobium to live in, essentially and it fixes nitrogen, making it into a form that the plant can use. And then we can eat the plants and get their protein, and we use it to build our body, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, another important thing I want to mention when it comes to plants and roots is fungi. And this kind of fungi is known as mycorrhizae. You can see the word down here, so I don't have to write it out. Mycorrhizae, or mycorrhizal fungi. These are don't confuse this for bacteria. These, this is a different thing from the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. But these are fungi that live in the soil, and there can be two kinds, ectomycorrhizal rhizae and arbuscular mycorrhizae. Okay? Ectomycorrhizae um, have cells that grow between plant cells, whereas arbuscular mycorrhizae actually have branches that go into plant cells. And either way, the important thing to note is, no matter what kind it is, is that they have all this extra fungal material outside of the root, and that greatly increases the surface area of the root, which means the root can absorb a lot more water and, and other nutrients that, than it could without the, uh, the fungi being attached. So it's uh, most plants that live on land, well, which is most plants, um, have fungi associated with their roots. And in fact, some of the oldest fossil plants we know of have fungi associated with them. So we think that fungi made life on land possible for plants. It allowed them to have the ability to absorb enough stuff from the soil to survive. So mycorrhizae are those plants. Now, um, this is just a really important symbiotic relationship between the two species. By the way, before I forget, um, if anyone thinks this is kind of cool, this uh, rhizobium, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mukherjee, who teaches genetics, he does research on this on, and the genetics of this and tries to get it to work in like other plants that normally don't do this, like rice, which uh, if anyone could ever get that to really work would uh, save millions of lives a year probably uh, because people who can't afford fertilizer could grow rice without the need for fertilizer. So if you're interested in that sort of thing and in genetics, uh, check out Dr. Mukherjee's lab in the future. All right, so mycorrhizae, they allow plants to absorb things. It's a cool, it's a cool uh, uh, relationship there. Uh, so once again, in ectomycorrhizae, the mycelium, which is the name of the fungal body, uh, forms a sheet over the surface of the root, and parts of that mycelium, the fungal cells, um, go between the roots. And this is in about 10% of plant families. Th that's this example up here. But in arbuscular mycorrhizae, the hyphae, which is... Uh, I haven't gone into fungi so much yet this semester, and some semesters I have, but hyphae is just the name for those strands of fungi, okay? 
So just to make sure you have the words right, mycelium is just all of the fungus here, and hyphae are these individual noodle-like strands, okay? So hyphae actually go into the root, and not only that, they go into the cells of the root. And um, this is found in 85% of plant species, and it allows for plants to get enough material from the soil to survive, okay? And I want to point out, and I keep forgetting, I keep going back to this slide, uh, going from fungi to bacteria. This process costs a lot of energy to turn nitrogen into uh, uh, usable form, but the bacteria get food from the plant, the sugar that the plant makes. And so they have a trade-off there. I didn't mention that earlier. Same thing with this fungi. This fungi gets food from the plant. Meanwhile, the plant gets extra water and nutrients from the fungi, which is really cool. And lastly, if a plant's growing in a uh, environment that's not very uh, nitrogen rich. Um, some plants actually evolve um, defenses to that or, or adaptations to that. In the case of carnivorous plants, they supplement their nitrogen by eating insects or small mammals, uh, and they get nitrogen from digesting those mammals. So Venus flytraps and pitcher plants and sundew. Sundew is really important uh, for us because we can find it here on campus in the nature reserve. So we have a carnivorous plant, this one right here, living on campus. It, it can eat bugs, steal their nitrogen, and use it to grow. All right, so that's all I really want to touch on with in terms of plant nutrients. It's a much more complex topic than we're covering, but I just wanted to tie plants and animals together in this chapter. Talk about the source of nitrogen, which is important for proteins, and also talk about um, some of the symbiotic relationships plants have with bacteria and with fungi that help them to survive on planet Earth. And I will see you later.